forest rangers, and campers, what are your unexplainable and downright creepy stories? Please help us grow by subscribing our channel Thread Tonic. Part 1. Account 1. In 2016, my boyfriend, now my husband and I, went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. Isari. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy. So I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually my boyfriend had no problem helping someone, but he said his time something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help, and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she just expected we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway. I hadn't really noticed anything that strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car, and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining, and everything was muddy, and we wanted the driest sight possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time, so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m., we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like, but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker is another way he described it. He jumped up and looked out the little window but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself another few times. I was too scared to speak, so my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left, he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road, but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed because we were leaving. I got, got alarmed by this, and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete we had bought just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light I couldn't really see. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed, though, before we got into the car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hasn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out gas tank had been siphoned out. But that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joked that that would make a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid, two. We only joked because we were about shitting ourselves from fear and adrenaline even then. The rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel. Account two. When I was in the scouts, or rather the local equivalent, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen by any human, after which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the camp master. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn. 
When I decide to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back, I stripped nude and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing so decided to go back. Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in, and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where Poacher dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene. A group of anglers hear some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten offal who is crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground while shrieking and weeping then runs at them to get to the lake and wash off. Account 3. One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeast U.S. Haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age. But I remember about 8.9 years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row and found out they were visiting from out west, and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question but were having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical, pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My bud wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for about them dying but said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think they helped kill them. Account 4. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana, Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear and saddlebags or saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, You want to see something weird? Of course I said yes. So she led me on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those you can plug in or wind up and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to. But that kills the batteries quickly, I do, and out in the middle of fucking nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large like some buried transmission wire, but small like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees. So naturally I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood, plastic top thing, no chair, no building, no nothing, just this outlet and this desk. I am staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest, when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. That fucker then lit up and started blaring static. 
The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet, weird as shit. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had taken a picture of it. Account five, not a ranger, but was hiking in Andorra with a friend, long story short. We got lost off the trail and ended up in Spain. Found another trail and we're following it, without a map. A while ahead of us, we see a man with two golden retrievers walking in the same direction we are. He looks young and is carrying climbing gear over his shoulder. We're rushing down the trail to catch up with him and finally do. We ask him for help with directions and he tells us exactly where we are and where we need to be, about 12 kilometers away. There's a town with a hotel. He says there's another smaller town about six kilometers away and that he parked his car there. He says he can give us a lift for the last six kiln if we like, but says that he's in a hurry. We are over the moon and so we hike together for a while. The dogs are nice and friendly, running circles around us. We are chatting away to the guy and he is really nice, but my friend and I are getting tired, and so we cannot keep pace with him for long. The trail bends away to the right, and the man, now a bit ahead of us, disappears behind the bend. We get there a couple of minutes later, and the trail is empty. No man and no dogs, even though the trail is a straight run for quite a while and we should have been able to see them. The two of us continue on, alarmed, waiting to hear. See something? or perhaps be murdered by a stranger. Nothing. We get to the town eventually, and from there made it to the safety of the hotel in the next town over. We were completely freaked out by his sudden disappearance, and to this day, we are both convinced he was a ghost. Account six, ex-ranger here. We had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop, I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that the local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night, and these ghost cats, as they are called, can creep right up on you without you hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight. If you hear anything, don't make a sound. We went back to the station, grabbed the lion pelt from the intern center and the night vision goggles, Head Ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other ranger got out the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls. Slowing, getting closer, I pulled the jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out. Turned on my mag light and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to me moving. At this point, the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted, Stay in your tents. Followed shortly by, she's coming around at us. And then, there's another one. And finally, let's get the fuck out of here. At that point, we turned off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness, and jumped in the jeep and sped off. Just after sunrise, they started peeking out of the tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30. When they saw all the huge paw and claw prints everywhere, they really freaked out. Your tax dollar at work. Count seven. I was camping in a campground on the West Coast. I have back problems. So when I camp, I sleep in the car. I had the back seat converted to a bench seat and put my sleeping bag there. I cover the car windows for privacy. Early one morning, I hear this rumbling sound. It's loud enough to wake me up. I'm a child of the suburbs, and what it really sounds like is when you push a shopping cart across a really rough parking lot, one with a lot of gravel sticking out of the concrete, then the car gets bumped, hard, the whole car moved, I immediately start unzipping the sleeping bag with the inside zipper, but that's not the quickest process. By the time I get free enough to sit up and look, there's nothing there. But some big animal had walked by, and I love to know what makes a rumbling noise like that. Account 8 not a ranger, but I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four-mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power. This property was right next to where the park started. To call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. 
My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night, I had been hearing noises in the woods, what I thought was someone walking, but then they'd just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door, and the owners didn't want me to install one. So I began sleeping in my car. Now this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin, and where I was hearing something, I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out. My roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed not once but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion-triggered cameras. There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up to the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us. Part 2. Account 1. Back in 2010, I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter. During the summer, the snow melt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged and decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a four mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears they should be sleeping. But if they aren't, it means they are hungry as fuck and I'm for dinner. For this reason, I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 down to the river and I figured... Worst case scenario, I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hyperthermia. It's a crazy plan. But once you're out there, you realize bear spray is kind of useless inside the tent. So one early morning, I hear these loud animal noises outside my tent. They are getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent. I just froze, and the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point, I could hear it sniffing my tent. I don't dare move. I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent, but it's still out there. And now I hear more than one animal. I finally poke my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear, though. It was probably the most scared I've ever been out camping. Count two. I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts. So we spent a lot of time in the woods, and some weird shit happened often but most of the time it was easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living shit out of me. I was a leader for the age group eight, 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year we stayed on that terrain and it was huge. Normally we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive so we were aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time it was impossible. Every camp we have what we call a night game. It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks while the leaders scare the ever-loving shit out of them. Obviously, we had one too during that camp. We masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints, I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage, so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there, I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end and I saw the shadow again. This time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare kids and decided to go over there as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree and while getting closer I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread. Something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay, but they didn't respond. 
The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless, I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree, and I noticed he looked like a male. He was barefoot, and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud. His hands were in a weird, cramped position. I was convinced this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank, so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run. It didn't matter if it was a, just a stupid prank and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank, it felt like I was in serious danger. So I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me, but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite and every single person that could be dressed like that was already there. They couldn't have gotten there before me, and if they did, they sure as hell didn't have the time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them, and that they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them, and we left it at that. Next day, I wanted to go check it out. Who knows, maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case, and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head, and there was a dead-skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops. They looked around quickly and brushed it off as just a prank from another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. We didn't notice anything weird after that, so it probably was a dumb prank. But seriously, some people have a fucked-up sense of humor. Account 3 I was out camping with my dog one night in a, along the Mogollon Rim of Arizona. It was dark and we were sitting around the campfire when we hear something behind a bush close to our camp. Instead of my dog barking at it, he begins to whimper. I didn't think nothing of it and just tended to the fire. After a couple of minutes, we were some more noises from a different bush. This time my dog gets up and goes over to the tent and scratches the door because he wants to go in. I toss a couple of rocks in the direction I heard the noise and nothing happened. I'm spooked now, so I toss a couple of pieces of wood on the fire and climb into my tent with my dog, hoping that the light from the fire would keep whatever was out there away. We eventually fall asleep and luckily had no other disturbances during the night. The next morning, I go out behind the bushes where we had heard the noises and found mountain lion tracks that were circling around our camp. I'm sure glad I didn't go looking at night when I heard the noises. Account 4. When I went backpacking at Philmont Boy Scout Place, every crew started out with a ranger that went out with the crew for the first couple of days just to make sure that they were going to be okay and had the necessary skills to get to their destinations. After they left the crews, they would head to the nearest staffed camp or pickup location. Our ranger was telling us about one of his hikes back after leaving a crew. He followed along a game trail since they are usually easy ways to get through the woods, and as he was walking a mountain lion walked up behind him and then scented him like a house cat does by rubbing against your legs. When a mountain lion does that apparently you involuntarily defecate and urinate in your pants and then hope to God the lion was just in a playful mood, as it turned out this one was indeed just fucking with him and he made it safely back to camp. Account 5 I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. Nearest town from guard station was about an 1.5 hours away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods there always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to, about two months into the seasonal job. I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it when leaving the cabin at night. I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about 3, 10 on 5, 4 FT in the air, 
To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling, get the fuck out of here. But the eyes only crouched down and inched closer. At this point, I could tell it was a large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area, and the creature leaped back a bit but did not make a sound. Tossed four or five more pieces and creature still inched forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys. Of course, the fucking solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grabbed my shotgun. Technically, you are not supposed to have guns in gov housing, but who the fuck lives in the, uh, hills have eyes, back, country, and does not carry. Outside, creature was bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my shitty headlamp, loaded shotgun, and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch. Rocking bench and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. Account 6. I'm an avid mountain climber here in the Philippines. One time my group went on a night hike to a mountain located in central Luzon. Naturally, we took the easier trail, North Peak, since we were hiking with some newbies. At around 4 a.m. we broke camp and started our descent. Almost one hour in, we noticed that we kept passing the same fallen tree and the same boulder. The trail was very straightforward and many of us have climbed the mountain before. But for some reason, all of us were going round in circles. One of the more superstitious hikers decided to make us all stand in a circle, utter a prayer, and leave an offering of food. Only then were we able to complete or dissent. Account 7. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers. Fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogollon to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rock makes it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high, centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring and the nighttime gets pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack, and the purple velvet sweatsuit. That's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German. And having a great time, we could not get over the purple velvet suit. It was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, wants to know where's he staying and where he came from. It was around nine, zero in the morning, and the only way he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guys is a goofy fuck and just points off toward the other mountain when asked where he's staying, going, we all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet, even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road, goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger pops by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in purple pimp sweatsuit. That range rolled off duty the next day and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. Never heard another word about the German in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but makes for a good story. Update, thanks for all the interest. I texted my buddy that was with me that day to reminisce about the German, and he reminded me that the purple pimp German looked a lot like the actor Reese Ifans, who played Nigel, the kicker in the Keanu Reeves classic The Replacements. Hope that helps with the mental image. The movie came out like three years after the camping trip. But we remember seeing the moving and thinking Nigel looked just like the crazy German. My friend reiterated how absolutely happy the German was. Account 8. This was around 2015. 
when I went on a day hike at a Mount GB, somewhere in the southern part of Luzon area. The week prior to my hike, I was in the same area with a friend. Being that the trail is relatively straightforward, we decided not to hire a guide. Fast forward to the present, I decided to do a nighttime trek with five of my colleagues in tow. Since I was the one who knew the trail, I was the group leader. About an hour or so, we heard something that went psst, psst, psst. As we were hiking the trail, we looked around thinking it might be one of the locals. Some parts of the trail led to small houses. Anyway, it soon stopped, so we forgot all about it. We soon reached a narrow part of the trail bordered by shallow cliffs on either side. Since I was the lead, I was very focused on the trail, and I didn't notice that my colleagues were lagging behind until one of them said, Hey, why don't you shine your flashlight right in front of you? I stopped walking and waited for them to catch up when we reached the campsite. I asked my colleague why he told me to shine the flashlight right in front of myself. Well, he whispered, you were walking so fast I didn't think you saw the child standing right in front of you. Part 3. Account 1. Me and my two other friends were walking on our way home from the summit of a MTB, also in southern Luzon, when a kid came to us asking if he can guide us for five pesos only. He was dressed with a blue checkered shirt and a white pants. He was very well groomed, his clothes were wrinkled, free, and his hair wasn't even messy at all. We knew the trail by heart, so we kept on declining his offer. Eventually we agreed, since we figured he would follow us anyway. When we started to walk again, he suddenly stopped following us. I called out to him, but he didn't mind me. He just stood still. I looked at my companions, and they were very scared. So I said, Okay, stay there if you want, but you won't get your five pesos and left. Now I told this story to fellow mountaineers, and they told me the kid was probably a child of one of the guides. Count two. This is a very popular urban legend surrounding a certain MTC, also called the Devil's Mountain. The famous legend narrates the story of a couple who went on a hike in MTC at midnight. They got lost when they accidentally took an unusual trail on their way to campsite. Even if the weather is threatening because of a storm and there was zero visibility, they still continued their hike. They arrived in a point where the trail forked and they turned left when they should have turned right. The left was a deadly trail, thus they never made it to campsite. According to local folks, the two were not found until now. Account 3. A group of hikers, together with a guide, went on a rarely used trail. On the way, they passed by a small village where the elders advised them to continue the trek but leave the only girl in the group at the village. They politely declined and continued hiking. Halfway through, the guide told them that he could only go as far as the first half. Being experienced hikers, they paid the guide and continued until they came to a fork in the road. As they were debating which road to take, a couple stumbled upon them and told them to take the left side. They continued following the couple even as it got dark and started to rain. Suddenly, their flashlights turned off simultaneously, but they still tried to follow the couple. When the rain stopped and their flashlights came back on, the couple was gone, and one of the group members slipped and almost fell from a ravine. It was the girl. Account 4. German tourists are different. I was doing some stuff in Death Valley NP a couple of summers ago and left via the opposite direction of the construction crew, so this is a second hand story. As we were all leaving after a very long night of pouring concrete, they should have been done at around sunrise, but things didn't finish up until like 1 p.m. or so. The archaeologist, let's call him Art, saw a faint glimmer of silver in a bush. Thinking that it was an old balloon, a huge problem. Don't release balloons, they always come down somewhere and end up as litter. He turned around to retrieve it. Instead, he found a German man sitting there under car windshield sunscreen thing with a piece of rolling luggage by his side. This was an area that was closed off to the public until the road was repaired and nobody would be back through until the next day, so he stopped to talk to the man, apparently the German man. Klaus is a good German name, let's use that, had been dropped off by his wife and mother-in-law the afternoon before and was in the middle of a long hike like 20-30 miles or so, 
He had been hiking all night and was taking a break to rest during the day. There were plans to meet up in a day or two, but the women were in Vegas at the casinos. After some discussion, Art learned that Klaus had no food or supplies and had only drank a few sips from one of his three one two-liter water bottles since he began the trek. He thought rationing it would be best since he only had a small amount of water. The temperature was already in the 120 degree Fahrenheit range, and Art had to explain that the guy could not stay there or he would very literally die. Klaus said that he would be fine because he trained by sitting in a sauna a number of times before he left Germany. Plus, how would his wife know where to pick him up if they left? After explaining the difference between sitting in a sauna and hiking with no food in a dry desert, Art proceeded to question what would happen if his wife's car broke down or if she got delayed for some reason. There is no phone service in that part of the park and nobody was supposed to be in the area to begin with, so Klaus would be SOL. If his wife didn't arrive, Claus finally agreed to jump into Art's truck and drive to the nearby town, 20 miles away. As soon as he got into the truck and took a few sips of cool water, Claus realized how hot his body actually was and that he was actually in pretty bad shape. When they got to the town, they actually met Claus's wife and mother-in-law in the parking lot of the only gas station. It turns out that they had broken down there and never made it to Vegas. After talking a little, Art had to get off, to sleep. He had been up all night and reminded Klaus to grab his roller suitcase from the back of the truck. Art casually asked what was inside, and Klaus opened it to reveal a suitcase full of water bottles. Klaus was so delirious from heat that he forgot the heavy bag that he had somehow been rolling across the desert was full of water. Delirium like that is a sign of sunstroke. Klaus probably wouldn't have made it through the rest of the day had Art not insisted on him getting into the truck. TLDR, German goes hiking in Death Valley and would have died if not for an archaeologist who was on his way to a hotel for a nap. Account 5. Back in the early 90s, my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a DNR officer. This was opening day of Deer Bow, season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile from any road or trail, I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently. They'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old, the kitchen confused me. But I figured they had left because hunting season had started, so I just continued on my way. That night I was telling everyone about it when Scott gets serious and asks me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him he warned me not to go back there and to be glad no one was there, apparently some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth so they wouldn't blow up their houses in two, make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops and they raided it a couple days later. I must have missed it. But the guys had set up multiple trail cams, which were damn expensive at that time, all around the area. Based on the pics on them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface, it seems like a well-thought-out plan from some smart people, but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently, they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking the meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area, they ended up getting 20 years in prison. Account 6. I have so many of these, but I'll share my favorite. I have been a ranger in the USFS for almost 15 years. But this takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. Weird, since wolves aren't known to be in the area. But when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted, wandered around for about three hours. No further calls during that time, until I took a break for water, sat down, had a snack, drank some water, and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and he came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it'd be confusing from a distance. 
I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog fucking took off, like he was playing to see how far he could get me to chase him. Typical dog behavior, I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand. The dog finally slowed down near a rock bed creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first. Then I noticed it. The overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones, I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, died by a self, inflicted gunshot wound to the head, He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone. She called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continue to be in disbelief, in a way, but I know what happened. Also, throwaway account because my main would give away who the individual in this post is and where it took place. The family still grieves for their son. Account 7. Not a ranger, but here's a good wood story. It's late spring. Heavy rain had flooded the dike and public hunting grounds, so I get the idea to go fishing in the shallows with my buddy. We have a good time, didn't catch anything and it's getting dark, so we light a fire to dry off before heading back. As the sunlight is swallowed up, we hear something I can only describe as a blood-curdling scream coming from the distance. A little girl, almost. Frogs, we thought, and kept talking, twigs snapping. Then again, but much closer. We heard it. Could have been as close as 30 feet at the tree line. We hightail it out of there and laugh it off once we get home. Fast forward six years, I'm on lunch break, and I'm telling this story to my lead, and he pulls up a video on YouTube and lets me listen. The same scream, he gives me the phone, and I see a mountain lion. They make that noise as a final warning. Account 8. I have a friend who is a trail ranger. Basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. He told me about this time he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well, so he said he was going to head back as it's a one-hour ATV ride. Friend finished up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind he's far off the beaten path, he called out, and no one replied. As it was getting dark, he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start, he then noticed that the battery was not connected anymore. He reconnected it and started to drive, but it wasn't going fast at all. Less than a half mile later, the whole thing died. He radioed back basically saying, Hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would, but it would be an hour. He asked if the other guy got back, and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire. But before long, he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed they had to be less than a 1,000 feet away. He radioed again and they said they were having trouble finding what path he might be on and haven't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they are because he left with the iPad that had the map. They said he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them, hoping maybe they can stop being drunk assholes and maybe have a map. He walked in their direction, but the voices seemed to be getting further as he got closer. Finally, after 20 minutes, he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call and they said the other guy was found passed out covered in vomit and was being taken to the hospital, but he crossed off everywhere. They found a stand, so they have a general idea where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. Bored out of his mind, he decided to listen to what they were arguing about picking up things like 
Well, it wasn't yours to take. I don't fucking care. You knew better and so on. His guess was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something intelligible. Then silence. The bang, a gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that, he heard nothing. Just his breathing for the next half hour until he saw ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything, and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour, a shallow grave was found, and in it was a long, dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. Thing was, it was a skeleton who was there for years. So either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. Account 1 was hunting public land with my dad, several miles from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on. Weather is shitty and I'm not hearing distant gunshots. So I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm gonna head back and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. 20 or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just fucking around putting stuff in my bag while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not to remove my pullover, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag, I thought I heard that faint bass of someone yelling. So I took an earbud out and noticed that crouched on the opposite edge of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger kinda just watching me. I stood up but didn't wave and I wasn't sure he had even yelled to me in the first place, so I didn't holler anything to him. We just kinda locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal. My rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open and were following all laws and regulations, I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie and radioed to my dad, we've got company. My motives weren't nefarious. I just didn't want my dad to come bumbling down the hill and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. I looked back up, maybe 15 seconds later, that ranger was gone. I mean, flat the fuck out gone. So eventually, I meet back up with my dad and start to tell him about what happened. Yeah, as deep back in here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good and hit the trail when he saw you on a radio. They get ambushed like that. As someone who gets nervous... Anxious around cops, it never occurred to me that I could be causing similar anxiety in them. If you're reading this DNR, bro, I'd like to offer you a heartfelt, my bad, and keep up the good work. Account 2. When I was a kid in the Colorado Rockies, I was taking my horse and the whole band of dogs we had, two labs, an Aussie and a Dachshund, to our pond by my grandparents' place. I decided it was a great idea to venture the back way through the thicker part of the pine forest, I knew the way, and so did the animals, horse included. About five minutes from the house, I was oblivious to the world and didn't notice that the dogs were no longer with me when I finally decided to come back to the real world and noticed the missing dogs. I turned back since you don't go anywhere without them. They were basically my guardians and supervisors up there. I get about halfway back to the house, come up a small gully heavily filled with pines, and there is this huge Tom Cougar just staring at me. Right in the path, I'm eight at the time. A little guy and a tasty morsel for this animal. Luckily, I had the horse, who upon seeing the animal immediately bolted directly back to the pasture. The cat seemed to run after us. Didn't really watch. We roll up into the drive, head towards the pasture, and I agree that this ends my adventures for the day. After I put the horse up, the dogs find me again and we are walking back to the house when they get real jumpy and timid. I stop and begin to look around. There is a large and old pine splitting the distance between the pasture and the house, and on the lowest branch I see that damn Tom again. Luckily, the presence of the dogs deterred any action, but I made it a point to pass far away from the tree, and as calmly as I can I tell my grandpa what happened. He goes outside, rifle in hand, and never found the bastard. To this day, I never venture out without a dog or a weapon, just in case. Account 3. 
My grandpa had a hunting buddy in the 70s who was basically a hermit in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was staying with him in his cabin deep in the Cascade Mountains during a hunting trip. No running water, no electricity, miles away from the nearest town or paved road. His cabin was built on stilts and on an incline. It had a 10F balcony from the base of the bottom of the stilts with no stairs or ladder to climb up on. My grandpa claims that he knew this man for a long time and said that he didn't have the personality to lie. I've also known my grandpa to never be one for bullshit. One night during the trip, they were relaxing at the cabin after a hunt and his buddy tells him that Sasquatch is in the area and to be careful going out at night, thinking he was pulling his leg. My grandpa chuckled and didn't think much about it. His friend then put on a very serious face and grabbed a few pieces of fruit, bread, and jerky and placed them in a bowl. He took the bowl out onto the balcony and set it on the edge and said, It'll be empty in the morning and then went to bed. It was an open floor single, room cabin, about 300 SQFT. My grandpa had a cot set up near the balcony window and was woken up in the middle of the night by rustling outside. He peeked through the window and saw the bowl, empty, and to this day still claims he saw four fingers resting on the edge of the balcony just before letting go, he never went hunting in that area again. Account 4. I was in the forest camping out under the lovely forests of Jersey. We set up camp and were all chatting in our tents and left the fire up so we can tell some great scary stories. All was going well until we heard a rustling in a bush. Textbook scary story stuff. We all think it's one of our friends who hasn't come back from the potty break. But just as the bush was rustling, we see the outline of a person circling our tent. We call out for our friend, but random person does not answer, and at this point he stops in place. We all start getting freaked out, as the person we see from outside could not possibly be our friend due to the height difference. One of the members of the group lies saying that we are armed and kill him. A good minute goes by before we all hear what I can describe as the most shrill scream I have ever heard and dude just up and leaves. Creepy part about this is that our friend who was out to the restroom says he heard said scream but saw no one around the camping area or even footprints of where the man should have been. We were also pretty deep into the woods as well, so it's not as if anyone who was just passing by could have found us, at least not easily. Account 5 My dad spoke to a Chinese woman who lived as a forest survey person up in the mountains for the past 30 or so years. This is in Canada about five years ago. As an unofficial sort of person, the government asked about when looking for forest fires, any sort of illegal shit, etc. She says that she spotted multiple Sasquatch, and that they are quite intelligent, and just don't want to interact with people, not even the young ones. But if she's out there, they're pretty chill about it. Because she grew up around that area, and remembers seeing them from a young age. She had a totally straight look on her face. And my dad said she's one of the most rational people he'd seen out there. He owned a strip of gold claim out that way at the time. And she said if he knew what was good to leave that land alone because digging it up would disturb a lot of shit in the area, and she wasn't sure it was a good idea. My dad wasn't so sure until he swears. Up and down, he saw one himself, and she said, that's the female one, and just went inside and left him out there to take the fuck off running. Account 6. So I'm a guy who is in the other end of these stories. Fall of 2017. I shot a deer right around dark about five miles out of my truck. I go back, get my gear off and grab my cart. I get to my deer, gut it quick, and head out. Well, about two miles in, my deer cart breaks. The wheel snapped clean off. Fuck. I had to sling the fucker on my back. About that time, I heard some coyotes, I'd say three or four, faintly on the gut pile. I go another mile before I take a break. I'm chilling there, listening to the yotes when it hits me like a hard tap on the nuts. They were much louder and many more yips than earlier, within a quarter mile, and here I am sitting like a fuck waffle with no weapon but a hatchet and gut knife sitting next to the second course of their feast. Now of course, the first three miles from my stand consists of fairly easy walking, dry, some thick spots, but overall a easy walk. But the last two, swampy as all hell and thicker than a motherfucker. I picked up, zigzagging through the swamp, running on adrenaline, not looking back as the easily dozen coyotes were about a 100 feet away. I never once stopped and never once looked back. 
On the home stretch, I hopped the five-foot gate with the deer on my back like it was nothing, though I collapsed on the other side, nearly passing out. I heard the coyotes hit the fence within ten seconds of my jump. They howled and snarled and screamed at me, who was clinching the knife ready to meet my maker, from the other side, and then just like that they were gone. The woods were silent, and I hobbled back to my truck and grabbed the deer. I called my dad and told him my story and told him I was tired and was going to take a nap in the parking lot. I was bloody as hell, scratches and cuts and bruises from branches hitting my exposed face. So I took a nap and was woken by a tapping noise on my window and then a bright light. I don't know who was more scared, me or the greenhorn DNR officer, wide-eyed, slack-jawed and baggy pants staring at the monstrosity I was. I told him the story, he checked my info and we had a good laugh and I went on my merry way. Now those who are going to ask why I didn't just drop my deer and let them have it, I don't know. It was only a five point, not very big, a very average deer. I'm just a stubborn fuckstick who doesn't think things thoroughly, but hey, the deer was yummy. And for the DNR officer that I have a new brown set of undies too, I've seen him on three occasions since, all three ice fishing. He calls me wild man and doesn't even check my information, nor does he check my fish. We talk quite a bit when we see each other. I consider him a friend actually. Bonus, I shot another deer about a week later from the same spot and was tracking it when I heard some more yotes 100 feet ahead of me. I had a pistol with me this time and unloaded a clip into the ground and they fucked right off. They slinked behind me, silently making a yip now and then, and I'd respond with a 9mm round in the dirt. Account 7. Late to the party, but a fun story. I live in an urban area, but grew up in the woods. I, I caught an Uber to a local land preserve for a hike. Had a good 20 minute chat with my driver en route. He was swearing up and down that he saw a flying dinosaur in this park. Amused, I press him for details. He tells me that he was walking there and sees a huge black shape fly up into a tree. It wasn't some hawk or crow, it was a fucking dinosaur. I laugh and inform him that he had stumbled across the rare dino turkey. He goes quiet for a moment before busting out, God damn it. My buddies are never gonna let me live this down. It totally was a turkey. I didn't know those mofos could fly. Count eight. I've had some weird stuff happen, but I'm probably the cause of a lot more unexplained sightings. I used to spend a lot of time in the forest, near my neighborhood. It's a small strip of trees that's biggest inhabitant is a fox. I got into vulture culture, taxidermy about a year ago, I've always been a fan of zoology, and being able to look at animals in a different way is incredibly interesting. When I was getting into it, the fox in the forest had just had kits and was hunting over time to feed them. I started kind of an exchange where I'd pick up bones and such from around the den, and if I found fresh corpses elsewhere, I'd leave the meat around the den instead of wasting it. Unfortunately, this garnered me the reputation of outcast. Horrible dead animal lady from most of the kids who like to play in the forest and noticed me carrying bags of rotting animal parts around. As far as I'm aware, none of them actually knew anything about me, aside from the rotting meat and the time I accidentally busted through with a bunch of live snakes, so that should pretty well cement their opinion on me. Part 5. Account 1. I work at a summer camp taking kids on canoe trios for a few days at national parks. One night after setting up campsite and quenching the fire I was doing last check of the campsite, I looked at the lake and saw this lone man paddling a canoe. I thought it was pretty strange, but it's not out of the ordinary. The only weird thing being that he was alone. He waved, so being the polite Canadian I am, I waved back, went to bed in the staff tent, and everything was normal. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night, so I decided to go stargazing as that usually calms me down. I exit the tent and see this man on our campsite, looking through our tarps and bags, for what I don't know. Maybe drugs or food, but that's not important. This stranger is by the campers I am responsible for. We make eye contact and this guy stands up. He is tall as all hell and I am quite short, so I quickly grab the first thing I can think of. A can of bear mace. This stuff is meant to like kill a charging bear, so I hold it ready to spray and tell him to GTFO of my campsite. We doesn't really speak just like, oh, I didn't see you guys. When he is leaving, I immediately wake up the other staff and we make sure he leaves. We use our sat phone to call park rangers with our position. 
the guy's characteristics and tell them the story. Without a doubt, the scariest moment I had won the job. I've learned not to fear animals, as for the most part, they are predictable, dumb, and not malicious. But people, on the other hand, the scariest and most dangerous thing to encounter out in the wilderness is a person. Account 2. Of course, not a range, but avid camper. We were camping along the Sunshine Coast in lower mainland British Columbia. It was the off-season, so not too many campers in the area, and we were in some beautiful land, lush jungle, like forested areas right beside the ocean. 5 a.m. in the morning, right before dusk, right behind our tent, we were camping by literally no other people I hear. Ho! Eh! Whoa! Eh. As loud as can be, I woke the fuck up real quick and asked my husband if he heard that and what he thought that was. He says, Do you want me to be honest with you? Uh, yes. I think it was a Sasquatch, and I'm like, no way, there's just no way. I started thinking about all the animals in the area and different calls they would make, and I'm a pretty avid camper and live in the country, so I do recognize calls of different animals. Cougar, bear, no, nope, owl, nope. I didn't go to sleep and kept the knife in my hand for another hour before the sun came up while I was on my phone googling what Sasquatch sounds like. I know there's a ton of conspiracy around this, but we did find a recording of a supposed Sasquatch that sounded similar to what we heard. Can't find it now. I'll keep looking. We went into town later that day and told a local and he's like, Yeah, lots of sightings around here. The natives even have totems dedicated to them. Well, shit. Account 3. Not a ranger. Last year, I went camping early springtime with some people at a pretty remote place, Wadigan's National Park. There wasn't many people around, and it was a really nice area. Two days into our camping trip, one of my friend's camp chair broke, and we went through all our stuff looking for cable ties. We searched tents and the cars, but we had no cable ties, so we just left it. That night, I woke to my tent shaking slightly, so I woke up my boyfriend next to me. We opened the tent, and it was one of my friends. My friend was in panic saying he couldn't breathe, that something was choking him. So we shot up with a torch and shinning it on his neck, we found two black cable ties tied around his neck. They were tight enough for it to be cutting off some of his airway. After we were able to cut off the cable ties, we went back to sleep. We did not sleep easily that night. The next morning, we asked my friend about it, like if anything in his tent seemed out of the ordinary. He said when he woke up that night, his tent was open. Account 4. I'm not a ranger, but I did used to live near a national forest, and when I was in high school, I had my mom drive me into the woods so I could take some photos on a trail for a photography assignment. She waited in the car, and I headed down the trail, saying I wouldn't be long. It's actually really pretty, and it leads down to a river, and you can walk along the edge as it turns around a bend. As I was walking, I distinctly remember feeling like I was suddenly in danger, and like something was watching me. I was wearing an orange raincoat, so I was pretty visible. I didn't have my glasses on, but as I looked over the river to the other side of the bank, I saw something really tall and gray, making its way through the trees, toward the river. I have never been so scared. I went into survival mode and booked it back up the trail to my mom's car where I told her what happened. It's still one of the freakiest things I've ever experienced. Wish I got a photo, but I was a 16-year-old, 90LB, girl and was freaked the fuck out. Account 5. So we're at this camper near the Dover Lights in Arkansas. It's not the fanciest campsite, but we managed to find this guy that spent a lot of time out there, as much as legally allowed, while also working, and apparently making a lot of cash. So he just vacations in the woods half the year. The guy offers to let my friend watch the place while he goes to visit his son. My friend automatically invites me and some other people to come hang out and we spend a few days there drinking, smoking, fishing, and fucking around. All in all, pretty okay. Until my female friend gets super drunk and barges outside in the middle of the night buck naked to eat beans by the handful out of a cold pot. As someone who admires cleanliness, I follow her out and try to make sure she doesn't hurt herself while everyone else just laughs. So there she is covered in beans, and I'm trying to convince her to settle down and clean herself off with a towel when suddenly her head shoots up like a deer in headlights. She just glares at the trees around us. We're alone, and it's pitch black, before literally growling and then sprinting into the woods. 
I have no fucking idea what to do. I've completely lost sight of her, and she's naked in the woods by herself. A few failed attempts to call out to her, and I do the stupidest thing I could have done by following her. About five meters into complete darkness, I look down and see a faint light from someone's phone. Picking it up, I see it's in camera mode, and there are pictures of us, very recent pictures, all in creepy night vision mode, with some looking like they were taken from the window of the camper, and the last one is of my friend running directly towards the camera, realizing what happened, I delete the pictures and drop the phone on a rock, crushing the screen with my foot. Still unable to find her and freaking out, I double back to the camper for help, only to find her still very drunk in a lawn chair naked. Carrying her back inside, I let her BF towel her off and they both pass out spooning on the bottom bunk. I never told them what really happened and she didn't remember in the morning. But I did lock the door and wake up every hour just to keep an eye on things. Account 6. I'm not a ranger, but I do have a story about the woods out behind my house. I've only ever lived one place in my whole life. I lived with my family up on a mountain in rural Alabama, like really rural. Around our house you could walk two or three miles in any direction and not find any sign of civilization except for the road leading up to our house. Just trees, leaves, and pine straw. So just a three-mile radius of private woodland. Anyway, one night when I was probably about 15 or 16, I had a lady friend at my house who I desperately wanted to impress, so I decided it would be cool to go walk out to my favorite spot in the woods. In hindsight, I know I shouldn't have done it, but the spot was my ace in the whole eight. It was super romantic, fireflies and the sound of a small stream the whole shebang. She seemed tentative at first because she was smart, but ultimately caved to the thought of adventure. So we start walking down the path I had cut out. I've got my lantern because I couldn't find the flashlight, so I couldn't really see too far out in front of me, but it was enough to see the path. So it's about a 10 or 15 minute walk, and about halfway through there was this kind of distant weird buzzing sound. It was hardly loud enough to interrupt our talking, but it was definitely there whenever there was a break in talking. At first, I really didn't think much of it. The woods can be a really loud place at night with all the bugs and it was getting to be spring, so I pretty much ignored it. Then after a bit of walking, it was definitely getting to be more and more pronounced. Eventually, my friend asked me if I heard it too and after I confirmed it, she was adamant about turning around and just going back. I agreed just to make her comfortable. But as we were going back, the noise just kept getting louder. And eventually, as we were almost back, it was clear what the noise was. The sound of someone playing a harmonica had been gaining on us in the dark the whole way. By the end of it, we were running pretty much full speed out of the woods across the yard and straight into the house. We went up to one of the windows facing the yard, hit the light and cracked the windowsill to listen. It was still out there playing. It's harmonica. And we listened to it pass the house and fade into the pines, by far the most surreal, horrifying experience of my life. Probably my most cherished memory, too, because that girl ended up being the one that got away. Account 7. I am a native Alaskan who grew up in the sticks. Once I was out hunting with an uncle, well, I was there anyways. I was eight at the time. We had been trying to find a small moose for quite some time that we'd seen take off into the forest across a field. Everything seemed normal except that the area was very quiet. Then again, we're two humans walking about, so we figured maybe the wildlife was just being cautious. Well, eventually we caught up to it at another clearing, and my uncle decided to take a shot as it was getting later, and we needed to get it skinned, gutted, and butchered before the sun went down. He hit it in the heart, and it only managed to stumble maybe another 60 feet to the edge of the forest. I complimented his shot, and we grabbed our gear and walked over. Now before I tell you this next part, keep in mind that moose are weighed in the thousands of pounds, generally. We're getting closer, and my uncle can't see the moose anymore. Weird? Because we'd seen it fall, and we knew it had been hit mortally. We get to the location, and the thing is just... gone. My uncle starts to enter the forest, and all my hair suddenly raised on my entire body, and I made a whimper. I'm not a wuss, but I had a bad feeling. My uncle looks at me, annoyed and confused, and just maybe 30 feet away we hear heavy breathing. First thing we think is grizzly, 
so he pushes me behind himself and gets his gun ready and shouts as loud as he can. I don't know what it was, but it dropped the fucking moose from at least a couple feet off the ground, we know because we heard the loud thud and tears off running the other direction. It is dark in the understory, so we don't see much, but my uncle decides the thing can have the moose. We weren't about to stick around to find out what could lift a whole moose into the air and carry it. Account 8. Ten years as a USFS forest ranger here. A little late to this party, and not even sure where to start as a decade will leave you with countless stories. But I've nearly seen it all. A couple of my favorites both involve fire patrol during the summer months when we were enforcing fire restrictions. The first was a dude at a beautiful area, camp next to a lake. About 100 feet from his camp was a giant reflective yellow sign that read, no camping or fires within one two mile of the lake. When approached and asked if he'd seen the sign, he admitted that he saw it. Puzzled, I asked why he was camping there and why he had a campfire. He replied that he figured he was one two from the lake, so he should be fine. I kicked a stone into the water and informed him that he was only about 10 feet from the lake and I was going to need his ID as I was going to issue him a citation Another time, also on a late-night fire patrol, we drove past a designated day-use, picnic area. This particular area had fire pits, benches, restrooms, water. It was well-developed. Right outside the picnic area was this old trail that led to a bridge site where the bridge was removed. Due to this, we had placed a carsonite signpost, slender brown fiberglass post for informative stickers, trail markers, warnings. This particular post had stickers on it that said, Area closed, no fires, stay on designated trails, and an American flag at the bottom. We roll up to a raging fire at this site, fire so big and so close to the Carsonite sign, that my stickers are literally bubbling and starting to melt due to the heat. Pretty angrily, I asked who wanted to be responsible for this blatant violation. The oldest guy there says he'll take responsibility for the party, follows me to my truck and proceeds to give me his ID in his police badge holder. He was a local police officer. I was floored. I gave him a stern lecture about reading signage and ultimately damaging government property. Endless stories, though. Suicides, ATV accidents, bear attacks. Very sad. Far too many Boy Scout violations to count. Poachers, murders, public nudity, sex in public, Underage everything you can imagine, life flight helicopters, forest fires and air tankers, fire crews. Enough said there. But all in all, I truly miss the million acre office, the woods, the trees, animal encounters, the occasional well-informed forest visitors, and the endless views, vistas, and sunsets, getting paid to hike, mountain bike, dirt bike, motorcycles, snowmobile, jeep, and play outside for ten years was clearly something I'll never forget. Edit. I somehow missed the creepy and unexplainable part of this request. Somehow I thought it was a request for stupid people stories. Part 6. Account 1. Not a forest ranger, but I used to live in a very rural area in my youth. And when I had just turned 18, I was helping with a family friend's security company. It was October, about 9 p.m., and we had just starting the night shift of patrolling what was once a manor house. A little backstory on this place. Rumor had it that the house was cursed and haunted by demons and tortured souls alike. In the time it had been standing, it had been a simple place of residence, hotel, hospital, nursing home, and was eventually left abandoned and derelict in the late 60s, in the 40 years it was abandoned. It had been broken into by kids and gangs and had occasionally been set on fire, all wanting to see this curse for themselves or believed it enough to want the place gone. I didn't buy the whole haunting thing, but the place certainly made me feel a little uneasy. Back to the story. It was dark. Like it always is at that time at the end of October, it was also cold. And usually the lights around the garden kept it light enough that we could see what we were doing without the need for torches. That was when the lights went out. All of them. That was weird, but not to worry. We had the flashlights on our phones. But our phone screens were flickering. Okay, that was super weird. And if it stopped there, I probably would have gone home believing that there was some sort of issue with the electricity in and surrounding the house. Some areas are like that, especially in rural places. 
I live in a rural area now and all the lights blow out and flicker a lot because the electrics just aren't that great. I wish I could say it stopped there. We heard screeching coming from the house. It didn't even sound human, I can't even describe it, but it was enough for your stomach to drop, like the floor just collapsed beneath you and make your blood curdle. And for what must, if you've been a solid 30 seconds, the inhuman screeching was accompanied by unintelligible whispers closer to us and the occasional shadow, depicting various acts of suicide and self-mutilation. When we all determined that we did indeed experience what had just happened, we called the police about the disturbance and high-tailed it out of there as soon as they arrived. No evidence of there being anyone in the house was found, no signs of a break-in, nothing. Our team of four people were the only people on the property. I haven't set foot in there since. However, the other guys did, and as far as I'm aware, they never had an incident like that since. Account 2 during high school and college summers, I worked for the Pike National Forest in Woodland Park, Colorado, trail maintenance for ATVEs, dirt bikers, hikers, bikers, etc. Amazing summer job. One summer when I was like 18, we were driving around patrolling on a rainy day, and we noticed a car with its windows down about 20 feet off the main road. We thought nothing of it and headed back. When it was still there the next two days after it had been raining all week, we stopped to check it out. On the car's front driver's seat are the keys to the car, a wallet, ID, and a few bucks cash. On the passenger seat was a note. I opened it, and I'll never forget what it said. Tell me again what it's like to feel anything except being cold. Yeah, we called the law enforcement officers, and they found him hung on a branch a few hundred feet away from the car. Twelve years later, and it still haunts me sometimes. Account 3. Back when we were about 14, my friends and I went up to stay at our buddy's family farm in rural New Hampshire, not much up there besides farmland and miles of deep woods. It was around midnight, and we had just spent a few hours fucking around, smoking cigars and building a bonfire up in one of the cow pastures. To get back to the house from the pasture, you needed to walk about half a mile through the woods and across another field, and the kid's dad had a tradition of messing with us on our way back. The usual routine was waiting on the porch and shooting Roman candles at us as we crossed the field. We started walking back, and as we emerged from the path, we started hearing loud rustling noises in the trees along the edge of the field about 70 yards away. We all ran into the middle of the field and hit the deck smiling, thinking my buddy's dad was about to start shooting fireworks at us. After about five minutes of the intermittent leaf, rustling and no Roman candles, our smiles were gone and we started debating if it was a black bear or some other big animal. The rustling was distinctly the sound of footsteps and would pick up and suddenly stop as if someone was running tree to tree. Thoroughly freaked out, my buddy pulls out his cell phone and calls the landline at his house. He stands up and walks a little in the direction of the house while my other friend and I stay laying down, staring in the direction of the noises. Suddenly something runs out of the tree line. I will never forget this image for as long as I live. We were still about 50 yards away, and there was only a crescent moon out, so there wasn't much light to make out fine details. But we watched as this inhumanly tall thing strode across a portion of the field and then back into the trees. It was skinny, with disproportionately long limbs, and in the dark appeared to be a solid light gray-white color. As it ran, its incredibly long arms and legs swung in this disturbingly unusual way, and it appeared to be moving much faster than it should have been. As fast as it had appeared, it was gone back into the forest. My friend and I looked at each other in silent horror. We stand up, ready to book it back to the house. My other friend walks back over to us. Oblivious to what we just saw, his dad picked up, he said he's been in bed for an hour. Without saying anything, me and my friend who witnessed it started sprinting for our lives back to the house. The other friend follows suit. We make it back, lock all the doors, and recount what we saw to the other friend and his dad. None of us slept that night. When we went downstairs in the morning, my friend's dad, whose bedroom was on the ground floor, tells us how throughout the night he heard something banging on the side of the house and windows and claimed he went out several times with his shotgun to find nothing. We thought he was just fucking with us at the time. But to this day he stands by that story 
As someone who doesn't believe in the paranormal, it's not a story I tell often, but the two friends who were there and I still talk about regularly, and it scares the shit out of us, just this year, I shared it with another buddy of mine who loves that type of stuff, and after a quick Google search, he shows me this link along with a few others. Scroll down to Wood Devil. When I saw it, I nearly shit my pants. The description and depiction of this creature from local folklore matched what I saw perfectly. I honestly don't know what to believe, but I know what I saw. And it's safe to say you're never going to catch me in the NH woods past sunset again. Bonus creepiness. The stretch of forest adjacent to his family's farm has been known locally as Boneswood and Devil's Wood for as long as his family has lived in the area several generations. Account 4. I worked in a forest for a couple of years. I think it was when I was volunteering before I was given a job, my boss. Another volunteer and I were out in a more groomed part of the forest for public use. There had been a school group earlier and one of us notices a hoodie on one of the benches. I would have ignored it, but my boss said we should take it with us. Someone might come back for it. We go over. Boss picks it up, looked at the outside, some sport team logo, checks the tag for a name, maybe a parent wrote one. Nope, boss says. Nice shirt. Shame a kid would forget it like this. And is checking out the material. Looking it over, then she yells and drops it. What? Look in the sleeve, I pick it up and look in. Hundreds of spiders. I guess that thing had been there for a while. Explains why it was big for a kid. Creepiest thing that happened to me. Account 5. Not a forest ranger, just the occasional hiker. I was with my girlfriend in upstate New York in New Windsor, I think. Really small trail, probably 45 minutes to complete the whole thing. But ran into some real creeps towards the end. In the middle of the trail, there's this watchtower you can climb and above the tree line, my girlfriend and I climb it and spend about 10 minutes up there. Then we hear some footsteps on the ladder. I look down, and there are two young men climbing up with machetes slung across their back. I don't panic, but my girlfriend starts freaking out. We are completely alone in the middle of this trail, just us two and our new visitors. Now, the watchtower viewing area at the top is maybe 20 square feet, so not a whole lot of room for four people. So I have my girlfriend standing behind me while these two guys come up and are acting all casual. Not a word is said for a couple minutes as these two young guys are just casually looking out above the tree line. I decide to break the silence and ask them what they're doing out here. And one of them says, We come out here pretty often looking for people. His tone was trying to be intimidating, but I could just tell that it was somewhat fake. Either these two guys were just trying to scare us or they were toying with us. I replied with a joke, Oh, you must have hid the bodies really well. And everyone except my girlfriend, who is still behind me, laughs. We spend a few more minutes up there. I am getting pretty nervous because no words are being said. All I'm doing is watching their hands to see if they make a move for their machete. Then, they both make their way down the watchtower. Not a good, buy nothing. My girlfriend and I watch them run off of the trails and into the woods. We discuss how weird it was, and how they were just trying to scare us. We decide that we are going to climb down and sprint our way to the car. We wound up getting to the car and getting out of there. As we are driving, my girlfriend tells me that she actually knew one of the kids. They went to the same high school. I was about 20 at the time she was 22. She tells me how he was one of those kids that was weird and got bullied in school and all those great attributes that you hope to see in a guy with a machete in the middle of the woods and how my girlfriend was one of the people who bullied him. Account 6. Obligatory, not a ranger, but by far the creepiest thing that's happened to me while in the woods. I grew up in a pretty rural area, and there was a gravel pit in the woods a few towns over that I used to camp at with my buddy, drink beer, and enjoy a nice bonfire. One summer night, we were there drinking and shooting the shit, and it was about 2 or 3 a.m. The fire lit our immediate area, but beyond the ring of light, it was essentially pitch black. We were dicking around as kids do and throwing our empty beer bottles out into the darkness, smashing them on the rocks out in the pit and generally being rowdy. The third or fourth bottle I arced really high and far, and after I threw it, I waited for the smash, but there was no smash or thump or any noise at all. I remember we looked at each other kind of drunkenly confused, 
and then out of the darkness, the beer bottle came whipping back up at us and smashed on the rocks near our tent. As drunk as I was, I remember how surreal the moment was, the strange sinking feeling in my stomach and rising panic. We got in his truck and sped out of there as quickly as we fucking could, never even went back there to retrieve our tent. Account 7. A fish and wildlife officer told me that one time they got dispatched to a house on an Indian reservation in northern Canada. They were told that a guy was complaining of a Bigfoot shaking his trailer. They went there and they came upon some elders of the reservation brushing off and hiding tracks with branches. They consider the Bigfoot as a spiritual creature. They have stories from back in the old days of run-ins with them. They are even on old totem poles. I also worked with a guy who reenacted fur trade days at old forts. He would get dressed up in his little Davy Crockett costume and act in front of school kids and such. He knew everything about Canadian history and said that back in the old days, Indians talked about creatures that lived in the rivers and they drew pictures to show what they looked like and they drew crocodiles. Account 8 I grew up in the Southwest and when I was in high school, my friends and I would often have bonfires on the weekends. We would go gather a ton of pallets from the industrial park and load them into our trucks and take off out in the desert and stack them high and dose them in gasoline. While the fire burned, we'd always goof off and just chat. Well, one night while the fire was burning low and we were about to head to sleep, we realized we'd never really driven beyond where we usually stop and have a bonfire. We were really out a ways from town, but we thought, heck, why not? So we decided to drive down the road further into the desert. The moon was shining bright that night, and odd shadows formed. As we drove through ravines and along small hills, we noticed a bunch of cars out in the distance. We decided to cut the lights and the engine and set out on foot to investigate. I mean, who could be out here all this way? As we started walking towards the cars, we made sure to be extremely quiet and careful not to make a noise. In hindsight, this probably wasn't the wisest move we've ever made, but we were curious. After walking close to the vehicles, we realized they weren't occupied, but then we started to hear some voices in the distance over a ridge. As we got closer, we saw some tents and we heard two sets of voices. One was a set of adults and the other a set of youth. We had stumbled upon a boy scout camp out. Now, what to do? We could hear the adult boys scout leaders at their wits end in their tent telling everyone in the other tent, the youth tent which was a ways off from the adult tent, to shut up and go to bed. Mind you, it was probably past midnight. The leaders then indicated that if they heard one more peep, they were going to pack up and head home that night. The boys shut up and then all was silent. My friends and I naturally agree it would be hilarious to go and mess with the kids and try to scare them. So we tiptoed over to the boys' tent and in a deep, quiet voice whispered things through the tent wall. We made sure we weren't letting the moon cast our shadows onto the tent. We did it so subtlety that it made them wonder if they heard anything at all. We whispered morbid things like, I'm going to slice your throat, or you better not fall asleep, etc. We started to hear the boys getting panicked inside their tent and whispering to each other. One of them called out to their leaders, and they just responded back by telling them to shut up and that this was their final warning. Then, one of my friends started imitating some sort of wild beast. We all started clawing on the tent and making noises, and they could see our shadows finally on the thin tent walls. The boys were straight up freaking out and yelling for their leaders. The leaders were super R pissed now and yelled they were getting dressed and that the boys should get dressed too because they're all going home now since none of them can shut up and go to bed. We hightailed it out of there and made it back to our vehicles and drove home. We thought we were so funny, but in hindsight, it's a pretty dickish thing to ruin a scout camping trip. But it was kind of worth it. My only regret was that we didn't stay behind and hide in the bushes to see how it all played out. And if the leaders would believe the boys. Hysteria. Scouts. If you're reading this, I'm sorry. And I hope I didn't scar you for life in regards to camping and having people believe you. Have a good laugh about it now. Maybe. Part 7. Account 1. I was with a trail ranger following a search of marshland that was next to a national park. Backstory. We were on vacation from the UK, where I was working at the time, and we had basically had to go out to a company outing around Christmas time. As it was when we started to party, 
work day off. Entire company from the U.S. offices was there. We had noticed one member of the team got drunk and basically wandered off somewhere. So we had to call rangers to find him. Luckily, we were being guided by a trail ranger. Before anyone says anything, getting really drunk in a national park is never a good idea. Most of us had one or two beers, and that was it. This guy couldn't really handle his drink and also had way too much of the blue can stuff people nicknamed Redneck's Finest. Not sure of the particular beer, more suited to European beers in pint glasses rather than this canned stuff. We didn't find him for a while to the point it got dark, like really dark. So we had to get flashlights looking for the guy. After searching many hours, we managed to get a search team together. After several hours, it felt like someone was following me alone in a national forest with only a mobile to contact us. So basically, I got lost looking for the guy. Panic started to set in because I didn't know where the trail ranger had went a few miles beforehand. So alone. No idea where I was in marshland, walking on soil, a few tall trees in the distance. Along the way, I hear what sounds like footsteps. Muddy, like someone was walking behind me in the marsh. Turn the flashlight to face the noise. It stops. Continue walking. Hear it again. Stop. Turn around. Point flashlight. It stops. Start to get really nervous. Happens again. Get a sudden sense of dread, so shoot off running. Manage to reach the trees in the distance, heart pounding. I run into the guy we were searching for, along with the trail ranger, saying he had managed to track him told him what happened to me, told me that the place in the marsh was infested with alligators, and that's the sound they make when they creep up on people. Says I was either very brave or very stupid to walk there because people have been grabbed by them before. We managed to make it back to the hotel with the guy slurring his words and still very drunk. Park Ranger congratulates me on my balls to brave marshland. In reality, I didn't know and wouldn't have went there if I had known. Still think about how differently it might have ended if I had known about the alligators. The noise is there when they creep up on you. But when alligators see flashlights, they sometimes stop in the dark. Never knew that. Apparently, a thing. Account 2. Not a ranger like most of the posts in this thread. When I was around the age 8, we used to go camping in the forest behind my grandparents' house. This was their land and was entirely private property. One night we are out there and our oldest cousin is watching the fire and the second oldest is showing us how to pitch a tent when we hear a loud crack of a stick. We turned around to see a man in his 30s standing there 20 meters away from us. He was wearing ripped up clothing and a blue ball cap that was missing the rim. My cousin pulled out his pocket knife and the guy ran away. To this day I still don't know who it was but this man was obviously not in his right mind. Later that night, I woke up to a person walking around the tent. I began to panic and grabbed my cousin's knife and held on to it for dear life. I stayed quiet for what felt like forever, until finally the person went away. I later asked my parents if they had gone out to check on us, but they all said no. I have literally no clue who it was and probably never will. My guess was he was homeless and was deciding to camp in a forest. Count three. I am an Eagle Scout who used to camp a lot for scouting. A lot of the reservations have tons of random semi-formal dogs that just roam and are not aggressive. I don't know. Maybe the rangers have a lot of dogs that they let roam free. Some are more shady than others, and some will come up and let you pet them, beg for your food. Also, there are coyotes that you can hear calling out nightly from 2 a.m. to about 4 a.m. intermittently. Anyways, it was not uncommon to wake up in the middle of the night to what I want to hope was just the dogs sniffing at you from outside of the tent and poking the outside of the tent with their noses. Never found any footprints to show what it was. Probably because the ground was hard and leaves covered all the loose dirt on the ground. Not paranormal, but still unsettling to know that either a random dog or coyote was checking you out in the middle of the woods at night. Account 4 not a lot of super creepy stuff in five years so far. My favorite story creep-wise isn't that creepy once you realize what it actually is versus your imagination running wild when walking up involves chanting and screaming from like 500 yards outside my park, think nine people screaming and crying and one guy shouting about the end in Spanish over the screams. Then you remember the big apostolic church and group camp was really quiet 
They had hiked off in the hills to speak in tongues and worship. Actually very considerate, it would have been much more disturbing to the campground had they done it in their sight. It was also far enough off-site where it would be weird for me to get involved. Also stopping worship off-site. And if it were a crazy cult ritual, then that's a good way to die. Indiana Jones Temple of Doom style, I chatted with the customers at sites who could hear them and explained it to them. They were relieved, generally, that all was okay. And ultimately, the worship stopped around 1045, so it wasn't the most disruptive group. So no major problems at the end. Account 5. I'm not a ranger, but I want to share a story from when I was in high school. I was climbing a quite high mountain called Marapi in Indonesia. The mountain stands around 3,000 meters high. I climbed with a group of 20 people, five were trained climbers, and the rest were newbies like me. During our descent, we divided the 20 people into three groups. I was in the second group, and our intention was to stick together. However, some of the girls were quite slow, so my experienced friend and I decided to run ahead and leave them behind. The instructor gave us permission, and off we went. But then my friend said, Hey, I need to take care of something. You can continue alone. It's not far from here. It was noon and the distance didn't seem significant. So I left him behind. However, as I continued, I found myself in an area filled with bamboo. Normally, the mountain is covered with typical rainforest trees. But this particular spot was densely populated with bamboo. The area formed a circle with a diameter of about 50 meters. Strangely, the way out that I had clearly seen before entering was no longer there. Panic set in. I tried to retrace my steps and wait for my friend, but even the entrance seemed to have vanished. I ran around for about two or three minutes until somehow the entrance reappeared and I waited for my friend. Account 6. Almost every night I hear coyotes howling. Just the other night I was taking a night walk with my dogs and had a bad feeling. I let my dogs lead me in front and I walked partially turned with my flashlight turned behind me so nothing could sneak up on me I think because the night was way too quiet it unnerved me. One of my dogs had her hackles raised as we got closer to home. As soon as we got inside and closed the door, a pack of coyotes started yowling in a mountainous area across the street from me. That didn't bother me because I know the pack lives and hunts in that area. But the fact that an answering howl came from the direction we had just come from, that was a little more worrying. I haven't had much run-ins with mountain lions as they don't show themselves much, but I have a similar story. I was walking just one of my dogs, my very calm golden retriever. Suddenly he looked off into the distance and started growling. I didn't see anything, but there were a lot of bushes around. I should have turned around, but I kept walking. A few feet later, I found mountain lion tracks. I noped right out. Account 7. Not a ranger here. Was on a cadet weekend six or so years ago at Thetford Training Ground, East Anglia, UK. Has been a training ground for a good century, and a bit so lots of history to the area. However, haven't found much evidence of any notable haunting in the area. Had a really good time, but a few slightly weird things happened, which no one was able to explain. No large native animals other than the odd fox or badger, but they tend to steer generally clear due to the nature of the exercises. Military. So involve gunfire. Quite diverse landscape for England with open spaces, pine trees, with large open clearings, shrubs dotted across the place, etc. Five of us cadets were on patrol through the pine tree covered areas on the outskirts of a big plain clearing around 3 square km. Only distinguishable feature was a large mound in the middle of this clearing. Anyway, one of us shouts a stand to, and in excitement and slight confusion as to what he could have seen, we all eagerly take a position. Laid pointing my rifle in same general direction as everyone else looking for the threat, Enko then tells us how he saw a figure on top of the mound and that it was probably the sergeant testing us. So we vigilantly go over low and behold there is no one. Remember the NCO, who was only 16, I was about 13 at the time, being very creeped out. 13-year-old me was slightly amused but mainly just ecstatic at being out in the woods, no adults and with rifles. No magazines though, haha. -ha. Could he have been fucking with us, of course, but something tells me he probably wasn't. Later on, we set up camp in a lightly forested area and get on sentry duties. 
I took one of the first watches and felt very creeped out, as if I was being watched. I had my rifle with me, giving me a weird sense of confidence, so brushed it off and lay there for a few hours. Later on in the night, another sentry orders a stand to, and we all hear rustling in the bushes. Pretty loud and we're all a little spooked. The adults go and investigate and come back telling us it's a rogue sheep from a nearby farm. Ha ha. Anyway, fast forward to the bus back and they tell us they never found the exact cause of this noise, but didn't want to scare us by admitting that last night. One of the adults also told me later she's always found that ground creepy. This woman is pretty fucking nails and never appeared to be scared by much, but admitted that she once was walking back to camp at night and swore she was being followed by footsteps that stopped when hers did. She really never took any jokes well and did not have much of a sense of humor. But still, maybe she was fucking with us all along, and this was an elaborate prank. However, she was not the sort to do this ha ha ha, not essentially too creepy, but still slightly out of the norm. Account 8. My friend told me this. They were in a cabin that had bars around the windows. I was right above them upstairs asleep. They were cuddling or having sex when they saw a leg suddenly start hanging from a tree. This was about 23 a.m. A tiny Indian man jumps down from the tree. He grabs the bared fence and just stares at them. Blank-faced staring. My friends were just staring at him back in shock. They said it was so scary. How long was he in that tree? Was he watching them having sex? Anyways, they debated to call the cops, but they would get in huge trouble for being in each other's rooms. After about 10 minutes of this fucking creep staring at them about five feet away, just a bared fence and a screen in between them, he unbuttons his pants, pulls his dick out and takes a piss and disappears into the darkness of unknown.